So let's now go back to the two so-called extreme strategies, the constant workforce and the zero inventory, or the also called the chase strategy. And I will go through uh, the example from the textbook in uh, uh, subchapter 3, 4, where we will look at uh, one particular example and try to solve it with these two, uh, two strategies. Uh, we are given six months and we are given a forecast for these six months and then we are also given some information about the initial inventory and the end inventory. So in this case uh, we have six months, one, two, three, four, five and six. The demand which now we can, we can denote it as D, which is the forecast minus the adjusted inventory. And we know in January, this problem says that the forecast is two, uh, 1,280, but you have 500 items on stock at the end of December. So the initial inventory is 500, and then the forecast uh, since the forecast is 1,280, the actual demand will be 780. The forecast minus the inventory on stock. And then in February, 640. In March, 900. April, 1,200. Uh, in May, 2,000. And in June, the forecast is 1,400, but you should plan with an end inventory at the end of June of 600. So the total demand adjusted by the uh, outgoing stock will be 2,000. 1,400 plus 600. This is now the demand. And we can try to make or find the cumulative uh, demand, how much we actually need. Um, or we can maybe try to solve the other first. Or we, we can go through the, uh, the other information here. We have the number of workers at the end of December, which is 300. And we have the hiring cost given here as 500. And we have the firing cost of 1,000. And we have inventory cost or holding cost as 80 per unit stored from one month to the next. These are the costs given. And uh, we remember from the previous example, we also used uh, the payroll cost. This is not included in this example from, from the textbook for, well, simplifications. Um, we can assume that the workers are transferred to another uh, department, so you will have not cost directly of hiring or firing, but, uh, but to transfer them to, to another department in, in the company. And then we can assume that the payroll cost will be a constant. You have to pay them anyway. But still, these costs are the cost of changing the, the work uh, tasks for, for, the, uh, for the workers or, or changing setup or, or whatever. So to hire or set one new person into the production uh, of, of this uh, type of, of product, you need to well, assume a cost of 500 and to remove that person from, uh, uh, from the production, you have to assume a cost of, of 1,000. Also here, you have information about historical production. And to find the K factor, you use historical data. You know you have produced 245 units. And to produce 245 units, you had 76 workers working in 22 days. which gives us a K factor of 0 
And this is now the k val value we should use when we want to find out how, mu how, much, uh, uh, how many workers we actually need to meet the production plan. So we can look at uh, the uh, we can look at the number of days first at, and try to find the, the zero inventory uh, plan. So then the number of days in each month can be shown here as 20 in January, 24 in February for some reason. Use the numbers from the textbook, so I'm not sure how they have found these numbers, but anyway, 18 in March and 26 in April. And 22 in May and 15 in uh, June. <coughs> and we can also find the number of units per worker which means that we will divine, div divide this number to the number of days. No, to the, to the number of, uh, of uh, units per worker. Divide this number to this number. You get 2.931. And 3.517, is that correct? Now, of course, you, you multiply by k. That, that's, uh, of course, what you do. OK. So you have the number of days and multiply by the k factor, this one, to find the number of units per worker in one full month. <coughs> then you will have 2.931 in, uh, uh, in uh, period number one. You will have 3.517 and 2.638, 3.810 and uh, 3.224 and 2.198. This is now the number of units produced <coughs> per worker in each of these six months. You have a given number of days and you have a k-factor, how much one worker will produce in one day. So using these numbers, we can also easily find the minimum number of workers required. Let's call that the W, because we have a given demand. We have a certain production for each month for one worker, shown here, which means that in January we need 267. This is 780 divided by 2.931. In February, 640 divided by 3.517, we don't need so many workers, 182. In March, we need 342. In April, 315. And then in the last two months, we have a quite large demand, 2,000. So we need in May, 621. And in June 2000, divided by 2.198, total of uh, 910. So, now this is the number of workers necessary each day, e each month of course, to meet the production plan. And 
Then we can just again, as we did in the previous example, make a table of hiring and firing, how much do you have to adjust the workforce from one month to the next. Okay, we start with a workforce of 300, then we have to fire or get rid of 33. And from 267 down to 182, we need to get rid of 85 more. And then up to 342, which means a total of 160 extra. Uh, 27 less from this month to this month. And then we need to hire many people in May and June. We have to first hire 306 and then 289. Like this. Which makes a total of 755 and 145. <coughs> we can now look at the units produced by these persons. Call that the, the P. We have a given workforce here. And we can find the number of units produced. We have uh, the number of persons, 267. They will work for 20 days and they have an average number of units, a K factor of 0 0.1465, which gives a production of 783 in January. It will be 640 in February. Then we have 182 working for 24 days and multiplied by the K factor. In March, 902. In uh, <coughs> April, 1,200. And in May, 2,002. And in June, 2,000. So here, we can see the production we have now used, well, we have rounded the number of workers, and we can compare the production here against the demand. And then we can see that we don't have exactly zero inventory, even if this is called the zero inventory policy, because in January, we are producing 783. We need only 780. In February, well, 640. 40 minus 640 should be zero, but of course, we still have these three items on stock. So they should be transferred. We, we still have three more items than we need in February. In uh, March, 902, but the demand is 900, means that we have two, produced two more items than we need, and the total inventory will be five. And these five will be transferred to the next month, production is the same as the demand and then 2002 versus 200 we add two more to the inventory and these seven are still on inventory at in June which means we have a total of seven plus seven plus five plus five plus three plus three which is 30 should that be correct items on stock with well which is stored from one month to the next month, according to this policy. The inventory is not exactly zero, but it is 30. But looking at this policy, we can see that we can even adjust it even more. Because here, well, we have three extra. In, uh, uh, in February, one worker will produce 3.517. But in March, one worker, 2.638. And that means that we have already three items on stock here. So we can adjust this one slightly. We, can, we don't have to hire 
160, but we can just hire 159 because we still have some units on stock here. So this is, uh, well, the textbook shows some slightly different numbers here, and this is uh, by using, looking at the inventory before each month and see is the number of items on stock larger than the units per worker produced, and if so, we can just, uh, we don't have to, to hire the last worker. And the textbook actually also use fractions, so they find it is possible to reduce this number to 13. Using integers, then I was able to reduce it to 16, but the textbook also use, uh, use fractions, and then it's, it's possible to reduce it even more. But of course this is, then you will have to, to deal with products, and uh, 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 which is, is possible to use fractions and calculate with, with fractions here. So I was able to reduce this to 3, 3, 2, and 2, and use 341 here, 620 here, and 909 here. So we don't have to, we need one less worker in March, in May, and June uh, when you are looking at the inventory level at the end of each month. This is not very important because this is a well, very small number anyway, which will uh, will not be well, count very much in, in the total cost on, on this policy. But still, you should know about it. So, trying to calculate the costs, try to remember these numbers here because for the zero inventory policy, what is important is the number of people hired, the hiring cost the number of people fired and the firing cost and the inventory on stock and the cost of storing inventory for one month. And of course the payroll cost, but in this example from the textbook, the payroll cost is excluded and assumed to be, uh, to be constant. But in, well, to, to make a total comparison you should also uh, use the, the payroll cost. Uh, when comparing methods to uh, with other uh, or strategies with other strategies, so let's now just try to remove something from here. Remember the numbers here and try to find the total cost for this strategy, which is uh, the hiring cost, which was uh, seven hundred and fifty-five multiplied by 500, the hiring cost per person, and 145 multiplied by 1000, which was the firing cost, and let's assume that we used 30 here, had 30 items, an overproduction of 30 items, which was uh, to the cost of 80 gave us a total cost for this strategy of 500 uh, and of course we missed something here because we had these 600 items which was added to the uh, demand in June since we should plan with 600 items. So, so this need, needs also, also to be included. <coughs> 600 and multiplied by the cost of 80. And in total, the cost of this policy would then be 572,900, excluded the payroll cost, which has to be added if you want to, to have the, 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 full, um, the full cost of, of this policy. But we can uh, look at the same simplified example by using the constant uh, workforce plan. Still we have uh, these parameters are the same, k value 0 0.1465. Uh, 
Uh, and we remember by calculating the constant workforce plan, we need to know the accumulated demand. How much do we need to produce up to each point in this time horizon? So cumulative demand for January 780, and then we have to add 640, which makes 1420. And then we add 900, 2320. We add 1200, 3520. And we add 2000, and we add 2000. This is now the cumulative demand, how much we need to produce up to each month in this time horizon. And <coughs> now we want to find the cumulative number of units per worker, which means we uh, We have the uh, uh, we have the k factor, and we have the cumulative demand of 780. So then, the cumulative number of units per worker will be 2.931, which is 780 and multiplied by the factor of uh, uh, the k factor how much each worker needs uh, the, the cumulative and then add uh, divide the um, or multiply the cumulative demand with with the k 2.931 <coughs> and in uh, in february 1420 will be 6.448 and 9.086 and 12.896 uh, and 16.120 and 18.300 which uh, should be that the, yeah well I'm just removed the, the number of days here which is the one number we are uh, we are actually uh, dividing by but that was in, in the previous uh, uh, in the previous table. So, to find the ratio here, find the critical month, we need to divide the A, the cumulative demand, by the D, uh, the, the column here, the cumulative number of units per worker. And we will find how many workers we actually need for producing these numbers in the cumulative uh, in, in the column of the cumulative uh, uh, demand here. So dividing this number to this number we find we need a total of 267 and 1420 divided by this number is uh, 221 uh, then 256 273, 343, and at last we need to produce 7,520 units, and the cumulative number of units per worker is 18.318, will give us a total number of workers needed of 411. This number will also be the highest number here. We remember from the previous example that we had a critical month in March, but in this example, the critical month is 
June, which also is the last month in the planning horizon. So that means that we can employ what we need, the number of workers we need in January, and still be able to meet the demand in all the month. We will have a graph looking more like this. And the cumulative production will be like this. So if we employ the number of workers needed in January, we are able to meet the demand in all the months and to meet exactly the demand at the end of, uh, of the planning period here. <coughs> so let's try to find the monthly production. And then we have a total of uh, 411, and we remember we had 300 when we started, or when the, uh, when the end of the last planning period, we had 300 persons employed. So that means we need to employ 111 more in January, which is the start of this planning period. So now a total monthly production by using the 411 uh, workers uh, and the number of days, which uh, of course uh, needs to be included, and then the K factor, we will have a production of 1,205 in January. In uh, February, we will have 1,445 and 1,080. 1566, 1325, and 903. And the cumulative production add each number to the previous for, for um, the previous period. Still 1205, and then we add 1445 will be 2650. And 37, 34, 5,300, 6,625, and 7,528. And now we can see the inventory level at the end of each period. The inventory here is the difference between the production and the demand. And in January, we have 12, we produce 1,205, but we need only 780, which means 425. 2650 versus a total of 1,420 will be 1,230. Uh, we have. Uh, 3,734, we need only 2,320 up to March, and then we have a stock of 1,414, and similar for the remaining month, 1,780, 1,105, and 7,528 versus 7,580 will say that we have eight items left on stock. <coughs> so the cost of this policy, we can try to use this space here. The cost of this policy will then be um, we remember we had 300 persons in end of December, we need 411, so we need to hire 111, multiplied by the cost of 500, and we don't have to fire anyone because we have the constant workforce here, we will have 411 persons employed for the full 
time horizon here. But we have some items on stock, which was the sum of the, the column here, a total of 5,962. And now this stock is quite uh, considerable, and it, it is um, quite costly uh, compared to the other costs. So here, 5,962, and also we remember that we had the 600 extra items, which should be on stock in, uh, uh, at the end of June, so we have to add 600 and multiply by the cost of 80, which was the cost of storing one item in one month. Total, 580,460. Which was not very different from the previous one. We uh, had uh, 572,900 on the uh, on the zero inventory plan, and here in this constant workforce plan, 580,460. Question? Why did it, uh, cost 600? 600 is uh, w the outgoing stock, which was uh, mentioned in the in the problem text, because we adjusted the production in June by 600, which should be on stock at the end of the planning period. This was the same as when we had something on stock at the start of the planning period, we had to adjust the production in the first month, and similar when we want to plan with some items on stock at the end of the planning period, we have to adjust by uh, the production by that number, so we have to add this number here. And these items also uh, needs to be stored, and they are costly, so we, uh, at, the, at the same cost, so they need to be multiplied by the, the unit cost of storing. So here, 580,460, and of course, as mentioned, excluding the, the payroll cost, which was not uh, included in, in this example. So here, even if the cost with a constant workforce is slightly higher than with the zero inventory, it will usually be considered as better in order to avoid uh, uh, unaccounted the cost of, of frequent change of workforce. And there are also some, some other uh, things which is, uh, of course, not directly included in the model because uh, well, the workers will probably be more satisfied when they are able to, when they have a, uh, well, a constant uh, workforce and they, they know that they can come to work the, the next uh, month and so on. Uh, there will be goodwill from society and workers, and there will be less need of training and adjustment and so on. So all models we actually learn in this course, they, will be, uh, they are limited, they, are, they will not show the, the full problem, and in real world you also need to account for some, some, other, uh, uh, some other things which is not directly in included in the model. Question? Four hundred and eleven minus three hundred. Okay. You had three hundred at the end of December. You need four hundred and eleven in the full period, so you need to uh, you need to employ one hundred and eleven more in January. So that was all about these two what we call the extreme strategies. The next topic is what we call the linear programming. And then we should also use the, uh, the com computer program called Lingo. You have uh, I've just showed it. It is uh, installed in the uh, computers on the uh, on the computer labs, and it's also easy to download it. If you want to have it on in your own computer, you can have a, a student version or a trial version, which is for free, and which is more than than good enough for for our course here. But by using mathematical methods like they do in uh, what, uh, what we call here the LP, the linear programming formulation, and solving the LP problem, you're able to find the optimal solution of such problems like this. And the optimal solution is usually somewhere between these two extreme strategies we have seen. But that will have to wait until next week. 
Uh, but as mentioned, this is also a part of your assignment, which you should deliver in, in two weeks. Okay, that's all for today. <laughs>